Wadamoli everyone, which means greetings in my traditional owner Bindal Biragava language and country. We are the traditional owners of this land and where we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to the Walgaru Gaba and Mungri nations and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait South Sea Islander communities who are here today and to our elders past, present and future. I would also like to acknowledge all family members of the late Dr Benita Marva Ni Nihau who is a proud Mungra clan woman and an Australian South Sea Islander woman tanner whose father was taken from Vanuatu. Dr Marva lobbied uh, for Australia's blackbirding trade to be included permanently as a part of the national school curriculum in remembering the 62,500 Melanesian men and women who, that were trafficked in, to New South Wales in 1847 and the influx to Queensland in 1863. Townsville's naming of Robert Towns is a celebrated entrepreneur and a notorious blackbirder who auctioned off young, strong Melanesian men and women at a location for we, which is known today as Customs House on the Strand. To each and every one of you here today, you are all distinguished guests, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I wish to also pay tribute to the Queensland Premier, Anastasia Palisak, and the State Government for hosting this State Funeral for this amazing lady. I've been honoured as part of my welcome to country to speak briefly of a grassroots politically inspired movement here in Townsville, of which Dr. Marvo was a stable influence in the struggle for land rights. The lo this local uh, knowledge of the black power movement defined as evident change in conversations for black and white relations in Australia. The homes and people I'm going to mention are many of the unsung heroes of our nation that I recall visiting at the age of 11 years old with my parents, Grace and Archie Smallwood, and my stepdad, Norm Brown. 23 Hibiscus Street, Aikenvale, was the home of our beloved Dr. Benita and her husband, Uncle Eddie Koikimabo, which was a home of the political discourse for real change. Other homes of great significance were 50 Brook Street Railway Estate, which was the house of the late Mildred Peter Pryor and their daughter, Renata. 213 Bayswater Road was the home of Dr. Ernest Houlihan and his late wife, Maud, as well as 1 Sycamore Street, Pimlico, the home of the late Kevin and Elaine Saylor. These homes have left an indelible print on my political and cultural life, as well as 27 Chandler Street, Garba, the home of my grandparents, Alpha May Stanley, since birth. Such household meetings led to the formation of the Aboriginal Advancement League in Townsville. Representatives were sent to Canberra to advocate for our people as part of the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Federation. Some of the families I remember attending these meetings, of which many are now deceased, of those elders were Marbo, Scott, Sailors, Gresh, Stanley, Bishop, Hilbron, Thompsons, McGuinness, O'Shane, Millers, Louis, Mai, Loven, Gaffney, Pryor, Smallwoods, Ross, Guy, Illan, Doolins, Clay, Sam, Casters, Waimaras, Passy, Tappins, Tallis, and to name a few, four special families. Co uh, the Congus, Thides, Limburners, Tapaus. Most of those people were the 57 strikers, the Illins, Doolins, Bacos, and Kyles. These families were instrumental in our political movement and cultural in North Queensland and have instilled a legacy that leads. Meetings at Dr. Marbo's house at 23 Hibiscus Street was focused on sovereignty for First Nations peoples in challenging blatant racist policies that oppressed our communities nationwide. Such discourse defined our political resistance, which transitioned the state of Queensland in combating government control over our black community demographics. Dr. Mabo's work in establishing the Black Community School led to the Indigenous placements in higher education, lobbied by Dr. Ernie Hulahan and her husband, Uncle Kweki who played a key role in establishing the Aboriginal Scholarships Program, which was assisted by the trade unions and the church, some churches. Dr. Houlihan, who's now 85, checked this speech before I'm delivering it. In 1964 and 65, he chaired the campaign meeting that led to the 1967 referendum success, along with Australian South Sea Islands advocates, Mrs. Faith Bander in Townsville, at the big hall where the Tate College is now situated at Fulham Road in Pimlico. Some key non-Indigenous supporters were Senator Margaret Reynolds, her husband Professor Henry Reynolds and Professor
Press and Nala Lutz, they were the driving force with the Indigenous communities behind these meetings. When the Whitlam government came into power in the 70s, that saw a revelation where many of these grassroots initiatives were funded and implemented. Dr. Mabo possessed, Mabo possessed gracious and a rare relentless spirit, and whenever she roamed, she was equally proud of her South Sea Islander heritage. Dr. Mabo was part of the complexity of a black Australian narrative that is often ignored, and one that is forged through dispossession of First Nations peoples and the slavery of Melanesian labourers. These men and some women were kidnapped from the 80 islands of Vanuatu and Solomon Islands to establish the economic base in sugar, maritime and pastoral industries for what we know as one of Australia's, one of the richest countries in the world, Australia. Since her husband's passing, Dr. Mabo focused on raising the profile of the Australian South Sea Islander community and expected to be the, and was, was the honorary patron of the Australian South Sea Islander Port Jackson interim national body in 2013. Dr. Mabo's patronage endorsed five Montauk national conferences and the wide consultation and development of the national constitution across Queensland and New South Wales. Dr. Mabo's patronage group also saw 2013 New South Wales Parliament recognition of Australian South Sea Islanders. Although Dr. Mabo's health was failing, she lived to witness by a phone that the Inner West Council Sydney committed to the annual raising of the Australian South Sea Islander flag at Petersham Town Hall on the National Recognition Day of South Sea Islanders. Furthermore, Australian South Sea Islanders educational resources are now to be distributed throughout the Inner West Libraries and a public mural as a reminder of Australia's blackbirding history. While we mourn the passing of a great Australian, what needs acknowledging is the prominence of Australian South Sea Islander activism by those who grew up as part of the Indigenous and Australian South Sea Islander communities and put their political energies into such as Aunty Benita Marbo, Mrs Faith Bandler, Dr Evelyn Scott, Judge Bob Belair, Shireen Malamu, Phyllis Corowa, Avis Dagara, Harriet Pangas, Richard Hillahan Senior, Nathleson and Nellie Inez, but to name a few, and our Embassy uh, brothers, Tony Curry, Billy Craigie, Michael <coughs> Anderson and Gary Foley. Whilst First Nations lawyer Paul Poe set the scene in the 60s for real land rights, Coe versus the Crown, the very foundation that forged the 1992 High Court Mabo decision with the support of plaintiffs James Rice, Sam Passy, and Father Dave Passy. Dr Mabo was a gracious and constant force behind the scenes throughout the entire political movement of her husband. Today reinforces Australia's black history and the ongoing call for equal rights and a shared prosperity through a call for recognition as we lay to rest one of our matriarchs. To the families and friends of Dr. Benita Marvo, and thanks to James Cook University for giving Aunt Benita that honour. On behalf of Aboriginal, Torres Strait and Australian South Sea Islanders that I have served politically for the past 50 years, we send our deepest love and condolences. Wadamuli and God bless you all.